I'm Nancy Jarvis, your moderator this evening. It's my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Ali Soufan, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of the Soufan Group, which provides security intelligence services to governments and multinational organizations. Mr. Soufan is a former FBI special agent who has investigated highly sensitive and complex terrorism cases, including the U.S. Uh, embassy bombing in the Sudan, the attack on the USS Cole in Yemen, and events surrounding 9-11. He serves as a member of the Homeland Security Advisory Council and is the author of the New York Times top 10 bestseller, The Black Banners, The Inside Story of 9-11 and the War Against Al-Qaeda. Born in Lebanon, he grew up and was educated in Pennsylvania. He has focused on Al-Qaeda throughout his career as a special agent based in the New York office, which had operational control for the FBI in the battle against Al-Qaeda, both in the United States and abroad. Please join me in welcoming Ali Soufan. I am uh, talking to you today on the heel of two big events that took place just last week. The first event, is bad, the second event is good. But I usually like to start with the good news, so I'm gonna start with the second event. It was just an amazing moment over the weekend to see how the Afghani people went out in huge numbers, defying the Taliban, defying terror, defying intimidation, defying 39 suicide attacks that took place two weeks before elections, to cast their vote and to claim their destiny. I know that Af Afghanistan still have a lot of things to do, a lot of hard road ahead of them. However, that was a great beam of hope. The other event, unfortunately, is something we hear every now and then, is about the Palestinian and the Israelis. And, uh, it seems that that negotiations is going nowhere. But that event reminds me in a story where a group of politicians died and went to heaven. And they asked God if there will be peace in the Middle East. And God thought about it and said, not on my lifetime. <laughs> now, I hope you didn't get insulted that I said lifetime for God. You know, this is a joke, you know. I mean, a group of politicians in heaven at the same time, come on. <laughs> so, but today, look at the top headlines in the news from the past few weeks relating to terrorism and security. Continued sectarian violence in Iraq, resulting of hundreds of deaths so far this year. ISIS and al-Nusra in Syria, establishing their territorial turfs and eliminating rivals and eliminating each other. Extremists carry out terrorist attacks in the Sinai and few other Egyptian cities. Boko Haram in Nigeria, killing civilians and blowing up schools and universities. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQIP, continuing its campaign of terror and intimidation in Yemen. Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb benefiting from the instability in North of Africa and reorganizing itself in the Sahel region. It's a big change from not so long ago where our focus was heavily on Al-Qaeda and mainly in Afghanistan and Iraq. So what happened? For a start, as the former British Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was asked what he considered the greatest threat a statesman might face, he replied, events, dear boy, events. President Lincoln once wrote, I claim not to have controlled events, but I confess plainly that events have controlled me. Events, the Arab Spring, civil war in Syria, instability in Mali, chaos in Libya, revolution and counter-revolutions in Egypt. Events change things. And this doesn't just refer to foreign policy events, but also to technological events, the internet, the rise of social media, Twitter, Facebook, all are events that change things, that change capabilities, that change realities, and that change the threats. 
The internet, for example, makes it easier to recruit and for people to self-radicalize. And that means the threat to our homeland doesn't just come with people on planes from abroad. It comes from internet users here at home in America. What I would like to do today is to give a brief overview of several events that impacted the change and finish with the state of terrorism, the terrorism threat. Let us start with the Middle East. There's been a greater deal of action. Egypt has swung from military rule to the rule of the Muslim Brotherhood and back to military rule. The fall of the Brotherhood in Cairo incapacitated its rise in the region, even restraining Turkey's Erdogan regional influence, weakening al Nahda party in Tunisia, and pushing back Hamas into the Iranian orbit. Iraq is still plagued by sectarian fightings that is directly contributing, along with the Syrian civil war, to even more radical groups than Al-Qaeda surging in the country. In Lebanon, Hezbollah, which has until recently successfully portrayed itself as the resistance, has undergone significant changes since, since its increased role in the civil war in Syria. As a result, there has been attacks by Sunni militants against Hezbollah strongholds in Lebanon. The same sectarian fighting, mainly seen today in play in Syria, very publicly and devastatingly, also is spreading elsewhere, from the Gulf state of Bahrain to even Pakistan. We are, in fact, seeing the region being pulled apart with the hold of nation states being replaced by the ancient fault lines of sectarianism, religion, tribalism, and ethnicities. What is clear is that the Arab Spring did change things. It formed a vacuum of power that allowed regional players to manipulate the political, sectarian, tribal, and ethnic divides in their own competing quest for regional influence and supremacy. On the other side of the Middle East, in Yemen, Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP, still represents the most direct threat against the US. However, its recent attack and its increased assassinations of security personnel are part of its local war against the central government. Over the past seven years, AQAP has very effectively pursued a populist course in Yemen. The group has focused on populations in the south and east of the country, long ignored by the ruling elite of the north, providing them with much needed social services and even more important resources, such as water. This has proved a savvy method for recruiting new members eager to attack Western targets. AQAP will continue to enjoy safe havens in the south as Sana'a is seen as neglectful and unable to secure the region in any meaningful fashion. The use of drones, drone strikes by the US, while effective in eliminating leadership, will further anti Sana'a sentiment and will possibly increase some tribal sympathies to AQAP. Let's now look at West Africa. The French military operations in Mali in early 2013 have caused a shift in focus for two major Al-Qaeda-linked West terrorist groups. These are groups, the Mulathameen Battalion and the Movement of Unity and Jihad in West Africa recently joined forces to specifically target French interests and their allies in the region. While this new militant group the Murabitun Brigade has yet to claim attacks. The two groups splintered from Al-Qaeda and the Islamic Maghreb. Though their alliances can be fleeting, there still exists a collective call to action. In Nigeria, Boko Haram, a terrorist organization that collaborates with Al-Qaeda affiliates, has existed in the West African countries in, uh, country in various forms since late 1990s. It, empl it employs targeted and indiscriminate violence to terrorize areas of the Northeast. 
Boko Haram is not the only problem in Nigeria's north. As offshoots such as Ansaru, along with ongoing sectarian and ethnic conflicts, have their own narratives of violence. Boko Haram's exploitation of porous borders and tribal traditions is causing problems for neighboring states, such as Mali, Niger, Chad, and the Cameroon. In East Africa, a Shabab is by no mean a monolithic group, but it has been the key terrorist organization in the Horn of Africa since its inception in 2006. Despite suffering significant internal conflicts, factions from a Shabab have claimed responsibility for a series of high profile terrorist attacks in Somalia and previously in Uganda during the 2010 World Cup event. Those attacks, along with September 21st attack on the Westgate Mall in Nairobi, Kenya, prove that a Shabab remains a viable terrorist organization capable of carrying out complex attacks, both on hard and soft targets inside and outside of Somalia's borders. A Shabab claimed it carried out the attack on the Westgate Mall as retribution for Kenya's two-year military inclusion in Somalia. Though Kenya's intervention served as a convenient pretext, a Shabab's attack was likely due to the organization's internal disputes and the unshackling of an international extremist agenda in the process. In June of last year, for example, a Shabab's radical emir, Abdi Godan, supported by militant minority and foreign fighters, attempted to eliminate the leadership of the clan-based majority of the organization. The split released the foreign extremists from the constraints of a domestic agenda, culminating in the Westgate Mall attack. Today, thrill seekers attracted by the adventure of jihad, individuals who seek a sense of purpose and belonging, and people raveled by the sectarian violence, already found a new destination, Syria. Granted, none of these motivations is necessarily a precursor to terrorism, though they often signify a vulnerability to the terrorist narrative and the toxic yet potent influence of Al-Qaedaism. Overall, from the western shores of Africa to the far edges of the Middle East, we have nations plagued with chronically weak governance, regions awash in weapons and violence, and serious and serious concerns of widening sanctuaries for terrorist groups. Sorry. What I would like to do in the time remaining is to, to turn to the current threat of Al-Qaeda, the organization that actually attacked us on 9-11. Al-Qaeda Central has been badly weakened by the United States counterterrorism efforts. In response, it adapted. It gave greater power to semi-independent affiliates, such as Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula, and to more loosely connected groups, like Boko Haram in Nigeria. In fact, AQAP is today very much operating as the link between the affiliates and between Al-Qaeda Central. To remain relevant, Al-Qaeda core has ceded their central operational control and embraced decentralized guidance and inspiration. The US and our allies' relentless pursuit resulted in Al-Qaeda's mutation but in decentralizing its operations into a diverse and scattered affiliates, it is currently more lethal and more challenging to contain and eradicate. However, it's also facing tremendous difficulties. Central Al-Qaeda today is focused on trying to keep the affiliates together. We see, for example, the divisions and splits in affiliated groups in both the Maghreb and Syria, where local terror leaders ignore Ayman Zawahiri's instructions and continue to publicly attack one another while their fighters even battle and kill each other. In a recent message, Al-Qaeda's leader Ayman Zawahiri urged them to avoid the killings of Muslims or striking those who they consider heretics such as the Shia and the Sufis. Yet the attacks continue to happen. And so it's clearly 
not everyone is listening. In fact, in letters found in bin Laden's house, there was correspondence where he complained that the actions of the affiliates were making him and making Al-Qaeda look bad. When Osama bin Laden thought terrorists were going too far, you can imagine how far they were really going. The reason we are in this position is because we lauded ourselves on our successes and didn't pay enough attention to how Al-Qaeda was changing and the role of the affiliates. We dismissed these affiliates and their propaganda as local problems irrelevant to the war against Al-Qaeda. But while groups like AQAP and Nusra, AQIM, and Boko Haram initially will focus their violence locally, terrorists who endorse Osama bin Laden's jihadist message inevitably move on to the global war against the West. That is the key lesson we learned in law enforcement and intelligence by tracking Al-Qaeda in the 1990s. Remember, even bin Laden himself started out by focusing on a local issue. United States troops in Saudi Arabia, his own homeland. Initially, the FBI and others in the intelligence community, we had to battle higher ups eager to ignore him. For money, for, for many, he was just a Saudi financier. So despite all our successes, Al-Qaeda revamped itself. And the cause of bin Laden has maintained a steady stream of new recruits, replacing the members that have been killed or captured. And as we mentioned in the start, Al-Qaeda has also been greatly helped by the internet and social media, which enable recruitments to take a place in chat rooms rather than just in underground guest houses. The narratives used by Al-Qaeda and its affiliates all follow the same pattern. They prey on local grievances, young men's lack of purpose, and their feelings of anger and humiliation and resentment. The recruiters combine this with distorted religious addict along with conspiratorial messages that blame the United States, that blame the West for all their problems. With this, sim with this seemingly clear explanation for their complex problems, recruit feel, the recruits feel empowered and embrace the jihadist mission. The Al-Qaeda ideology, which blames the West for the Muslim world's problems, rejecting anyone who doesn't follow the Al-Qaeda specific beliefs and claiming that terrorism is the only way to deal with opponents, had previously found sanctuary mainly in Afghanistan. Now it has a spread from West Africa to Southeast Asia. Combating the group's ideology has been the weak link in our counterterrorism strategy. Because Al-Qaeda today is more about narrative than anything else, that should be a signal to us about the power of narrative. My colleagues and I completed a global study traveling everywhere from Northern Ireland to Indonesia, Kenya, Uganda, to look at how terrorists and extremists recruit. Our investigation yielded important lessons, including the following. First, there is no cookie cutter approach to countering the narratives of extremism. Tactics vary not only from country to country, but also from community to community. Two. Both international, both traditional media and new media play an important role in recruitment and in countering the narratives of violent extremism. Because it's easier for extremists to recruit today than ever before, thanks to the internet and spread of social media tools, self-radicalization is on the rise. This has been a major factor in the increase in homegrown terrorism in the West seen horrifically last May, uh, last year of May 22nd on the streets of London, England, and on April 15 in the streets of Boston. Four, just as all politics is local, so is extremism. Extremists use local grievances as initial motivators to recruit. Dealing with local and regional issues is the starting point for countering the narratives of violence. Again, education. 
Education is the enemy of extremists. There is a striking absence of critical thinking among members of extremists and terrorist groups. A critical component to any counter-narrative campaign is to promote education in critical think and critical thinking in vulnerable areas and among would-be recruits. Where there is a lack of alternative narratives, extremists will fill the void. In North and West Africa and the Sahel, we saw how a confluence of internal and external factors combined with a lack of alternatives have aided and spread the violence of extremism, the violence, violent extremism. One of the most powerful tactics is the involvement of former terrorists who know firsthand what narratives inspire people to join groups. In addition, promoting the voices of victims can be a powerful message against violence and against extremism. Religious leaders, faith-based organizations, and community resiliency groups can play an important role in both countering the narratives and rehabilitating extremists. The bottom line is that just as terrorists pay attention to the medium, the message, and the messenger when recruiting, we need to pay just as much attention, you know what, even more attention to the message, to the messenger when we counter their narrative. So where does all of this leave us today? I've warned for a few years now that it is a mistake to think just because we successfully diminish the operational capabilities of Al-Qaeda means that we are on the path of a sec secure future. For me, the measure I recommend using for how safe we really are from the threat of international terrorism is how many safe havens are there from which terrorists promoting similar rhetoric to Al-Qaeda can train and operate. Is that number increasing or is it decreasing? If you take Al-Qaeda, the group was fortunate to have safe havens, first in Sudan, then in Afghanistan, and in those environments where Al-Qaeda could freely operate, bin Laden was able to organize, set up bases, safe houses, trading camps, and also plot attacks. Al-Qaeda continues to operate out of Waziristan and some remote tribal areas between Afghanistan and Pakistan, but it's not only from there where they operate today. Al-Qaeda and its affiliates can operate from many other locations, many other places that emerged recently, including south of Yemen, including the remote mountains of Mali, Syria, Somalia, some areas in Lebanon, Iraq, and beyond. So having briefly reviewed this unsettling security map, what should be our appropriate course of action? The answer, the answer is not in putting boots on the ground in faraway lands. The answer is not in more wars in distant regions. In some conflict zones, the US has outsourced much of the fight to a series of local proxies. Keeping American boots off the ground has had important benefits. Deploying, for example, the African Union peacekeepers in Somalia has been relatively cheap and has kept Washington out of potential guagmire. But the proxy strategy has also failed to achieve a number of US counterterrorism objectives in these regions. It has created recruitment opportunities for Al Qaeda and other extremist groups and has regionalized the impact of long simmering civil wars. Rather than conflating state building with counterterrorism, Washington can and should address the threat posed by Al Qaeda by developing smart strategy, targeting only those individuals who pose a direct threat to the United States citizens and interests by all means possible, including kinetic strikes. We have to be very careful not to engulf ourselves in broader and historical conflicts that are internally oriented and should not be the focus of the United States counterterrorism efforts. I think we seem to be on the right to track, though. It's still early in assessment. However, recent United States counterterrorism operations may point to revisited inclusion 
of joint task force special operations to capture and interrogate subjects for actionable inter, uh, intelligence and then prosecute them in federal courts. And that's extremely important from a strategic perspective, federal courts. See, strategically, in combating this asymmetrical threat, the most important thing to internalize is that our moral values as a nation, our principles as a country, are the most effective weapon in our arsenal. The strategy needs to be comprehensive, and it needs to be framed within our constitutional creeds. Our strategy has to include every tool available in our toolbox. Law enforcement, military, intelligence operations, specialized counterterrorism operations. It should include diplomatic efforts. It should include psychological programs, economic programs. It should include counter-narrative operation and counter-violent extremism campaigns. We need to develop unique local and regional plans for local problems. We need to identify dangerous trend lines early on and neutralize them before they become deadly fault lines. There is no cookie cutter approach that can be imported from one country and used successfully in another. What works in Mali and the Sahel region won't work in Tripoli. And what works in the north of Yemen won't necessarily work in the south of the country and so on. Just like extremist groups understand that different locations have their own incubating factors that appeal to potential recruits, factors that sustain terrorism, we too need to develop solutions tailored to the uniquely local incubators. Instead, there's always a tendency to generalize, to link, to paint the brush strokes, to take all problems and put them all in one basket. Mali is not the same as Nigeria, which is most certainly not the same as Somalia, and Yemen is simply Yemen, regardless to efforts by some to make it as if it's the next Afghanistan. We cannot continue to tackle current problems by labeling, linking, and then addressing them as if they were merely reincarnated problems of the past. I'd like to finish by reminding you where we started. How the threat today is so different than it was even a few years ago. The key takeaway for that is that we, we in government, we in policy, we in media, we the people, we who have impact, we who are trying to have an impact, we need to be as flexible and adaptable as possible to stay ahead of the changing threats. In a time of increasing complexity and escalating tensions, and an era of decreasing budgets and dimin diminishing capabilities. Is it possible to develop strategies and models at, that might enhance the nation's interests without creatively speculating about probable, even possible outcomes? Perhaps the most realistic model for addressing this challenge might be found in a proper merging of experience and imagination. The 9-11 Commission, in their 2004 final report called the failure to prevent the tragic attacks, in part, a failure of imagination. Analysts commonly asserted that they could not, and here I quote, imagine someone flying a plane into a building. See, their analysis stopped at the edges of what had been observed in the past, instead of wondering if and how someone could do such a thing in the future. Another graphic example of such personal experience-based analysis unfolded in February of 2003, when the administration then observed on the potential challenges that would follow an invasion of Iraq. They said, and I quote, first, it is hard to conceive that it would take more forces to provide, st to provide stability in post-Saddam Iraq than it would take to conduct the war itself and to secure the surrender of Saddam's security forces and his army. Hard to imagine. This is another example that shows how in our business it is a must to constructively leverage the potential of imagination so we can glean more value from experience. Ladies and gentlemen, any policymaker or analyst who starts an assessment with, I find it hard to imagine, 
is very likely confusing the limits of their own imagination and experience with the limits of reality. The point here is that we need to be less like a slow bureaucracy and more like a top company adapting to changes in the market and staying one step ahead of the demands. Let me conclude by saying that America will only prevail when we understand the true nature of the enemy we are facing and the asymmetrical nature of the war we are in. When knowledge replaces fear of the unknown, when confidence replaces panicked responses, and when decisions are made based on expert advice rather than political calculations, there is no enemy that cannot be beaten. My service to our nation puts me at times face to face with some of the most hardened terrorists. I know, I know how it feels to look evil in the face. But also at the same time, my service to this great nation gave me the privilege of serving alongside some of the bravest and most talented people I've known. And I can tell you that our enemies are no match to the best America has to offer. Doesn't even come close. Many, many of uh, their successes will probably kept secret and will only be learned in the future. And some successes are next to impossible to quantify. For example, how do you count how many would-be victims are saved by disrupting a plot or taking out a terrorist cell? The lesson for both friends and foes that the history of a great nation tells us that America will never fail. America will never falter. So we have to be determined never to fail and never to falter. Thank you very much. Thank you for that tour of the current circumstances and also for urging us to use more imagination in our analysis and understanding. You've given us a perceptive panorama of a multiplicity of, of affiliates or Al-Qaeda units throughout the world. Right now, if you had to rank the threat to the United States of these, what would be your top three and why? Well, first it will be uh, Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the individuals who lead that organization are people who were with Osama bin Laden. Uh, the person who's heading the organization uh, today is a person who used to be the secretary for Osama bin Laden. So the closest group um, um, to bin Laden and to Al-Qaeda Central are those guys in, in Yemen and in the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, they already attempted to strike the United States. I think uh, you remember the underwear bomber uh, a few Christmases ago and uh, the printer bombs that they send in cargo. And uh, they have uh, a very talented bomb maker who has been uh, trying to uh, find ways to, uh, uh, you know, put bombs on planes. Uh, so they still, they have the capabilities and they have the intention to hit the United States. Uh, those individuals, uh, yes, they are focused locally, but also at the same time, uh, they are focused still um, uh, to hit United States targets and Western targets because of the message of Osama bin Laden. Uh, uh, you probably also heard about uh, Al-Awlaki, who was involved in uh, doing a lot of recruitment for Al-Qaeda on the Internet. Uh, he was offered protection and sanctuary by Al Qaeda and the Islamic uh, Al Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula. The second group uh, have not attacked the United States yet, uh, but uh, I think it will be a matter of time, and it will be. Uh, and, and this is a group that is more radical than Al Qaeda. Uh, basically, they are so radical that Al Qaeda kicked them out and he said, "You guys are crazy." And uh, those guys, uh, they used to be the affiliates of Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and now they expanded their operation to Syria. In Syria, that group get divided into two different sections, a section that stayed with Al-Qaeda, and they call themselves Al-Nusra, Jabhat Al-Nusra, and they are the official affiliates of Al-Qaeda in the Levant. And the other group is the ISIS, the uh, Islamic State of uh, Iraq and Asham. Sham means the Levant in uh, in Arabic. 
Um, this uh, group has been uh, conducting uh, a lot of activities in Syria, uh, but also at the same time, uh, some of their leaders uh, mentioned that they will be uh, focusing on, so on the United States and some of our allies. Uh, the third that I am fearful of uh, at this point uh, are individuals who are fighting with al-Qaeda, training with al-Qaeda in, in Syria. I mean, al-Nusra is probably one of the most powerful groups in, uh, in, in the Syrian uh, civil war. And uh, many people uh, come from all over the world. I mean, the numbers, uh, there are more foreign fighters in Syria today than we had foreign fighters in Afghanistan during the Soviet Jihad. So that can give you an idea. And a lot of them are coming from the West. We have, I think, a few dozens from the United States. Um, now, not everyone who went there to fight in Syria is a terrorist and will come back as a terrorist. However, um, I fear the recruitment of some of these people. Uh, so when they go back to London or Paris or, you know, whatever, or New York, uh, you know, they can conduct uh, some attacks. So those are the, the three um, ranked. In the British press, there's been substantial comment on the radicalization and the return of British-born uh, Islamists. Whereas in the U.S. press, that simply doesn't seem to be an issue. Is, is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think we have Kim Kardashian tweet it, and then every, it will be a big issue. <laughs> are there groups that we have not heard of that are a potential threat? Well, tell me the groups that you heard of, and I'll tell well, you. Well, the ones that you <laughs> mentioned in your, in your speech. Uh, I think uh, the groups that I mentioned in my speech um, are uh, groups that can be considered either part of al-Qaeda or, um, you know, uh, groups that kind of like splintered from affiliates groups of al-Qaeda. Like, for example, uh, you have a few different organizations uh, currently operating in the Sahel region and in the Maghreb. Um, so uh, we, mentioned, we mentioned them. But even among these groups, uh, they are people who fight each other. And usually they fight each other in two things, uh, egos and money. And, and that's basic resources. Uh, which we see sometimes even in Washington. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, outside Al Qaeda, yes, you probably you know we didn't mention, for example, Taliban Pakistan. Uh, we didn't mention uh, the Taliban in Afghanistan and the different factions that you have in Afghanistan. Uh, we just focused on affiliated groups of Al Qaeda. Would you please discuss the relationship between Al Qaeda and Iran? Also, please briefly explain the Mujahideen al Qaq and how it factors into this relationship. Mujahideen who, I'm sorry? al Qaq. Mujahideen Haq, okay. Haq. Uh, Mujahideen Haq has nothing to do with Al-Qaeda. Mujahideen Haq are basically uh, an organization that uh, came uh, to, uh, to exist after the Iranian Revolution in 1976. Um, and they oppose the Iranian regime. Um, the uh, Al-Qaeda and Iran, after 9-11 and after we attacked Al-Qaeda and destroyed their sanctuary in Afghanistan, many of their members escaped to Iran. Um, uh, the great majority escaped towards Pakistan and a few went to Iran and the Iranians uh, put them in jail. So we don't know what happened when they were under the Iranian influence over there. Um, and, um, you know, there are some um, reporting uh, in uh, media, in the media in the Middle East, that Iran is probably supporting uh, some Qaeda affiliates like, uh, or what used to be a Qaeda affiliates like the ISIS. Uh, however, I think that is probably part of the internal divisions now in the region between Iran and Saudi Arabia. And um, I don't see any kind of hard evidence that points to Iran, uh, you know, operating or, uh, you know, uh, uh, controlling um, Al Qaeda. But I won't be surprised if they are, if there is. If, if there is a member or actually a few members of al-Qaeda who have been under the Iranian control for a few decades, um, uh, that they probably listen to, the Iranian, listen to Iranian instructions. 
You mentioned the uh, Taliban in Pakistan and the Taliban in Afghanistan. To what extent in each of those countries uh, does the Taliban control al-Qaeda or vice versa? No. Uh, I think after, before 9-11, um, we uh, saw the Taliban giving sanctuaries for al-Qaeda. Uh, but uh, al-Qaeda never controlled Taliban, and Taliban never controlled al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda was operating independently, and there was a uh, very good relationship between Mullah Omar and Osama bin Laden. Um, I think uh, uh, we have to differentiate between the Taliban in Afghanistan and the Taliban in Pakistan. The Taliban in Afghanistan, uh, they are many different organizations. Yeah, like the Mullah Omar Taliban is not as strong as it used to be when it had controlled what it controlled Afghanistan. And we have the tendency in Western media uh, to basically uh, declare anyone who is against our presence in Afghanistan as Taliban. I mean, the Afghani has a deep history in hating outsiders. <laughs> and when uh, they don't have outsiders to hate, they hate each other. And that has been since Alexander the Great until today. So I don't think we're going to change it. Um, so the, 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 there, is, the, there are a big difference between this. Now, the Taliban, Pakistan, yes, they had a very close association with al-Qaeda. And we saw that in the terrorist attack that took place in host uh, a few years ago against uh, the CIA uh, substation over there. As terrorists are using social media, isn't it relatively easy for the U.S. to monitor their activity? It is, um, but the problem is, <laughs> you know, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And uh, that makes it uh, very difficult because you can always change your IP addresses. People don't know where you are. You can always create a new chat rooms. And by the time you identify one, they open 10 different ones. So it makes it difficult. Uh, it can be monitored, but in the same time, it's, uh, it's very difficult to, uh, to put down. Uh, you know, you cannot control the internet, basically. You said each country must find its own way to limit extremism. What individual advice would you give to the countries most at risk? Well, again, <clears throat> uh, it depends on the country. <laughs> uh, like, for example, you have places that have a lot of, um, you know, um, political corruption. You have places that the central government doesn't exist in, in outside the main cities. And that vacuum create a fertile ground for extremist groups to operate. Um, what I mentioned, not that every country has to find its own way. People who can find their own ways, they should. What I mentioned that in, in us, in the United States and the West, fighting this threat, we have to develop uh, solutions for local problems. We cannot just like everything is Qaeda, everything is Afghanistan, everything is Taliban. Um, we have to promote, for example, education problem uh, programs, let's say, in Yemen. And instead of Al-Qaeda giving water to the Yemenis, you know, let's open a well in areas that is that can be considered, I mean, it's oversimplifying, but uh, as part of a more comprehensive strategy, our counterterrorism strategy shouldn't be only drones. Drones is a tactic, not a strategy. We have to develop a more comprehensive strategy in dealing with risk areas without putting American boots on the ground. How does Saudi Arabia figure in extremism, either as a supporter or a victim? Well, Saudi Arabia as a country is a victim of terrorism. Uh, but Saudi Arabia as a society, um, it has been, uh, um, you know, in so many ways, um, people from the kingdom have been funding um, extremist groups. People from the kingdom has been promoting the narrative of extremist groups. And people from the kingdom have been uh, uh, supplying or convincing uh, um, youth in Saudi Arabia to go and fight with al-Qaeda. And we've seen that in Afghanistan before. We see it today in Syria. And it became so bad that the king himself had to make a law uh, just last month saying anyone who go outside Saudi Arabia and fight 
uh, for any jihad causes uh, will be considered a terrorist and will be prosecuted when they come back. And they gave them an amnesty for a few months for all of them to come back. Uh, so, you know, the government have been trying to do a lot of things to contain that threat, but also in the same time, uh, you know, the, the, the whole culture in the kingdom uh, makes it extremely difficult to contain religious speech that is promoted by the government. And some people take advantage of that speech and take it to the extreme and brainwash uh, brainwashed kids who don't have any other option, uh, that jihad is their only way, um, you know, uh, for, for only way uh, for a better life. Has the work and press coverage of Malala Yousafzai affected terrorism in a long-term or concrete way? Are there other people or organizations who are more effective at promoting education, especially for women? I think, uh, I think at the beginning, it, uh, it definitely promoted uh, an anti-Taliban sentiment in Pakistan. Uh, but I think that is, unfortunately, became the story of yesterday. And, um, and uh, today, I think, we have to focus and help uh, organizations uh, that can do these kind of things uh, in different areas, in Yemen, in Pakistan, in areas that can be vulnerable to extremists. Let's move away now a little bit from the broader implications of policy and to your more personal experience. What is the most surprising development in international security you've seen since you left the FBI? Uh, the return of history. I think uh, cold, the Cold War by itself was just a pause in history, and now Mr. Putin, by taking uh, Crimea, uh, hit the play button again. And I think uh, we start to see with this world that we live in, uh, a world that you don't have one superpower, uh, you don't have unilateral power, you don't have a Cold War either, but also at the same time, you have a lot of regions, and these regions have some countries that always throughout history exerted its own geopolitical influence in that area. And we see that in the Middle East with the struggle between that's going on between Turkey, between Iran, Saudi Arabia is trying to have a piece of that. We see that with Russia, we see that with China and the Pacific, uh, we see that uh, in many different countries around the world. So all these uh, conflicts that we used to read about before World War One, uh, it seems that they we start seeing see we, we start seeing them uh, coming back to the geopolitical map. And what do you think is an appropriate response to the Crimea problem? Well, uh, you know, Crimea is. Uh, an issue we cannot blame the United States for it. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Putin took Crimea, and he took advantage of uh, the EU. The EU basically uh, did not know um, how to manage that negotiations with the Ukraine. How can you do a deal with the Ukraine without taking into account Russia's interest? Uh, I mean, that's, uh, that's something that is this, you know, Iraq is maybe our fault, but Crimea is definitely the EU's fault. Um, so I, I think, um, I, I fear that, you know, there is nothing that can be done at this point to bring back Crimea, but what we need to do is to uh, basically work with the European and work with NATO in, to establish, uh, you know, kind of like a, a new world order, if you want to call it, or new European order. Uh, to contain uh, the spreading uh, of, uh, you know, the, the, the spread of, of, of Russia in its former uh, orbit states. Uh, going to your book, The Black Banners, for those of you who have read it, you've seen this. For those of you who haven't, when you open the book, there are certain pages that have lines that are blacked out. Oblig black bar, maybe three or four sentences, maybe a word. Maybe a letter. Seriously. Yes, a Seriously. letter, that's correct, yeah. too. Um, the CIA censored some of your book. Have you experienced government interference in your private work? Please explain. Um, I won't explain. 
so um, I don't have to explain. Uh, if uh, if I felt that they, uh, you know, interfered with something like this, I, I you know I, I took it very hard when they first did it, uh, especially that the FBI approved the book, and it took them. Usually it should take them 30 days to do it, it took them three months, but there was not even one single redaction in the book. We, we showed all the information uh, has been declassified and, uh, and uh, they approved it. And I have no idea why the agency insisted that they're gonna r review my book because I don't have any uh, contractual agreement with the CIA. I wasn't a CIA officer. I didn't work for the CIA, I worked for the FBI. However, they've done it, they, they, they did it. Um, and uh, I took it hard at the beginning. Uh, but now, you know, I see what they are doing to the people who should over, you know, th their watchdog in Congress to Sissy, and I don't feel as bad. <laughs> I would like to withdraw one of the requests that I made to you earlier tonight, which was to keep your answers in a kind of short TV length and ask you, uh, because your book is so extraordinary, to reminisce a bit, we have about six minutes here. If you could reminisce a bit about your work in the FBI, what was most important to you, and the, some of the discouraging things that you recounted so well there also. Um, I think, uh, for me, the FBI was not a job. Um, it, it was really a family. And um, I think uh, I have a phenomenal group of people that I was working with. I was assigned to the FBI New York office. Uh, I started working in terrorism. And uh, I wrote a paper about a guy that we should watch, and his name is Osama bin Laden, and he might be a very dangerous man. And uh, then my career wrote itself. Um, I worked on the East Africa embassy bombing, and then I worked, I was in charge of the USS call attack. And uh, that was probably one of the cases that's so close to my heart because um, we did everything by the book. We get excellent confessions uh, from people who are involved in, 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 in the call attack. And those individuals told us about something was happening in Southeast Asia that they delivered money to, and that was the Malaysia meeting that was the planning for 9-11. Unfortunately, at the time, we asked for that information. Do you know anything um, happening in Malaysia? And uh, um, our government and the intelligence community said, no, uh, we have no idea. There's basically, we don't know anything about that. On uh, September 12 of 2001, I was in Yemen looking for some of the people that flew planes in the United States to the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Um, and I was given a file that shows, that showed clearly that our government knew that they were here. At least some people in our government knew that they were here. And uh, knew uh, that those are the people who were in Malaysia. And that was basically the subject uh, investigated by the 9-11 Commission um, during the first congressional investigation of 9-11. It was determined that, uh, you know, uh, the information was given to the FBI but wasn't passed to us. On 9-11 Commission, they uh, determined that it wasn't, and especially wasn't given to us. Actually, uh, it said that even though Director Tenet and Kofor Black, who was the head of the CTC at the time, testified in the Joint Inquiry Committee that they gave the information to the FBI. After extensive reviews of uh, documents that were not presented for people who prepared their statements, you can see that a lot of lawyers wrote that, uh, we find them to be in error. And, uh, and actually one of the conclusions of the 9-11 Commission that if that information was given to the people investigating, to the FBI agents investigating the USS call, 9-11 could have stopped at its early stages. So this is when, you know, uh, at, at the beginning I was like, you know, working cases, going around the world, um, living, you know, Advent, you know, an adventure in so many different ways um, with my FBI family. And that includes 
some sisters and cousins in the CIA, and that includes people from DOD. But I think at that day, I think the innocents died. And I realized that, you know what, not all of us are fighting the same fight. Um, and then 9-11 happened, and later on I was a supervisor in the FBI, one of two supervisors supervising the, the investigation. And I had to go around the world and interview a lot of uh, subjects. Um, I actually was one of the very first people down in Guantanamo Bay. And when we arrested the very first, um, what they called high value target, Abu Zubaydah, I was tasked to go and interrogate him. And uh, this is where a lot of the redactions start happening in the book. Um, Abu Zubaydah gave a lot of the information that he gave uh, to us, an FBI agent and an, two FBI agents who were talking to him. Uh, and we were working extremely closely with uh, our, uh, our colleagues from the CIA. He gave us, for example, that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was a mastermind of 9-11. In the United States, we didn't even know that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was a member of Al-Qaeda. We knew he was a terrorist, he was wanted for Manila Air, and he was wanted for the Bojunka plot, but we did not know that he was a member of Al-Qaeda. Uh, he also gave us uh, information about uh, Apidia, the dirty bomber. Um, unfortunately, uh, some people decided that they need to bring outside contractors to do the job because apparently nobody in the U.S. government uh, is good enough to get information from these guys. So they hired two contractors who uh, never interrogated a person in their life uh, and never probably met nor interrogated uh, an Islamic extremist, which takes different kind of specialty. <laughs> um, they started to implement what uh, you know as the enhanced interrogation techniques. I contacted the FBI headquarters, and the message came back from Director Mueller that we don't do that. And they pulled the FBI out. As you can imagine, I uh, became, uh, you know, as if I wasn't a target by some people because of the 9-11 Commission, I definitely became a target <laughs> after uh, being blamed for pulling the FBI out of the program. Um, later on, as now we hear, and that's something that I said in my statement, and it seems that the CC report in Washington uh, goes hand in hand with that. Later on, we found out that they took all this information and they briefed it to people in Washington and higher ups, and the, including the president, as information that was uh, uh, produced as a result of waterboarding. And uh, we know from different documents that has been declassified already. See, I'm trying to just tell you about the stuff that is that I can talk about or I testified about. Uh, because a lot of these things hopefully will be out soon if they declassify the CC report or the executive summary. So uh, what I can talk about now that some of the stuff uh, they claimed, uh, you know, like uh, Pedia, for example, that KSM, even President Bush in 2006 said, you know, waterboarding, that's how we knew about KSM. That's how we knew about the, the, the dirty bomber Pedia. Uh, they made him a dirty bomber. He's, 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 an old, you know, he's uh, just um, two brains away from being a freaking idiot. So mm -hmm. he's, 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 but anyway. Uh, but all this information was given to us. It wasn't because of waterboarding. And uh, one example that I can give you that has been declassified in the efficacy memo um, that is still classified. However, it's referenced in some of the Office of Legal Counsel memos. It said that uh, Jose Padilla was arrested 
in November of 2003, uh, sorry, in May of 2003. So they are giving a timeline for that. Well, Jose Pedia, you can check the news, was arrested in May of 2002. So you'll say, why did they say May 2003? Because waterboarding didn't start until August of 2002. So in order to make it fit, you make typos with the dates. Same thing with uh, Ramzi bin Ishib. They claimed Ramzi bin Ishib was arrested in December of 2002. Well, that is not true, because I was there. I picked him from Pakistan. <laughs> it was poetic justice, September 11, 2002, a year, the first anniversary. This is where we took him down. So, yeah, when you make a lot of typos with dates and doctor a timeline and brief it to everybody in Washington as extremely, very highly classified thing, a lot of people are going to believe that that's how we get the information. Uh, not everyone is going to Google information that they get in a very high-level secret brief <laughs> to see if it's accurate or not. Um, so... After that, I, um, a few years after, I was doing a few cases, and after I finished all the cases that I've, you know, I was doing, I was actually, uh, my last case, I was doing an undercover on the side, and uh, after we arrested all the people who were involved in the terrorist cell, um, I submitted my resignation and uh, left the government and never looked back except when I have to give them my book for redaction. <laughs> Thank you for your frankness, uh, your knowledge, and, and your efforts to, to protect all of us, to, to protect Americans, but others as well. Um, the World Affairs Council is very lucky to have someone like this who can share uh, experiences. Um, I'd like you to remind you that Mr. Soufan's book is available over here on the side. And I would like all of us to express our appreciation to our speaker. Thank you.